the, the following few slides uh, for a, a lot of you, I guess I'm preaching to the converted, and this might be a little bit basic, but it might be that there are some useful uh, things you can take away when you're talking to your colleagues who have no real understanding about why this is important. There's a couple of slides here about why I think this is important uh, and ways to try and get this across to your colleagues when you go back from the conference. Uh, a useful analogy which I find helpful in thinking, thinking about data is quite hard, so I think about fruit. Uh, and then at the end some, uh, well, it was going to be recommendations, but they're not nearly well thought out enough to be recommendations, so I'm calling them provocations uh, to sort of colleagues around them. Uh, fair is capitalised. Uh, because if you want to Google something to do with this subject, uh, the FAIR principles are uh, findable, accessible. Anybody else know them? No? Interoperable, you know, and re reusable, reusable. They're, they're really important one, I think, for what we're talking about to do today. So, uh, in the context of our conference theme, uh, why should we bother? Uh, we should bother because uh, good data is part of being a good archaeologist, in my opinion. Uh, you owe it to society. Uh, most of the work that we do is paid for in some way by the public. Either it's uh, uh, directly by the public or uh, a developer uh, is going to be passing on those costs uh, to uh, society, the people that buy their houses or, or build, buy their buildings. So uh, you are part of society and you are providing a benefit. Uh, and also you owe it to the people whose lives you are investigating. Uh, Archaeology is created by people, just like us. Uh, so why should we not value those lives in the same way that we value the lives of people today? Uh, and uh, also people will be using your research in future, and that's really the, uh, the focus at the moment. Uh, many of you will have come across the Roman Rural Settlement uh, Research Project, which was published back in 2016, and included a series of methodological studies trying to get to grips with why it was really difficult to do research on archaeological data that has accumulated over the last uh, 25 years. Uh, they particularly focused on field evaluations and watching groups um, because there are so many of them. Uh, so some of what is uh, being discussed here is particularly related to those smaller scale but also just as significant uh, interventions. Uh, and this is what uh, a boiled down model of what it should look like, a research science. So we start off with the design uh, and work through the particular types of field work. Uh, the data flows into an archive and it's then available to be reused uh, by researchers in the future. And what the Roman Rural Settlements Project found and the study that Alice Catamold did, which, uh, uh, which Claire mentioned earlier, uh, is that there, you know, there are hot spots in the system. Um, it, the flows are not working correctly. Uh, and what was apparent when for those from those papers, they're all on the Cotswold Archaeology website still. What was apparent is that often those hotspots are where information is going from one stage to the next. So there may be perfectly good approaches within uh, people collecting field work, but that data that they produce doesn't actually work for the archivists. So Claire mentioned the difference between what you might collect on site and what the ADS would actually like you to collect. So that's a, a sort of hotspot. So, uh, like I say, talking about data is very difficult, so let's talk about fruit. Uh, if you think of fruit as the subject of your raw data, let's not talk about archaeology for a moment. When you press save on a file, this is what happens. It goes into a tin, it's safe, it's there, uh, you have a tin of fruit. Fine. Of course, that's not fine. You know, we all know that that's not enough. A tin without a label is pretty much useless, so we stick labels on them. Okay? So we have, now we have fruit cocktail, we have basic metadata. In that tin is some fruit. Uh, so it is findable, that's that first of those principles, I think, it's findable. You can go into the shop, and rather than having being faced with a shelf full of, in, of uh, unlabeled tins, you can see that that one's fruit cocktail. That's basic. Uh, more detailed metadata that we were just talking about with on the tables is more like the, the, what you see on the back of the tin. Um, and it's all, as you familiar, increasingly there's large amounts of, of labelling on food that uh, support different diets, different... Uh, we, there never used to be cautions on fruit salad. Uh, and of course you need, to make it accessible, you need the right tools, so that's your software. 
So that's accessible. So okay, so we're, we're getting there. But uh, just to go back a bit, that yellow circle up the top, that silly fruit that's made up of sixteen percent of your sugar intake for a day. That's 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 quite high. Um, but you can't use that without ingesting all that sugar. Well, you could if we made the data interoperable. So all the different ingredients were separated out into their own bins, and you chose the bits that you wanted. So I think about those fields on the form that we're thinking about. Um, if you mix them all together, uh, like we talked about with uh, site code or project number, uh, then you can't separate them out. You have to save sugar as well as the fruit. But if they're separated out into different bits, you can have the pineapple, you can have the strawberries, you can have the apple, whatever you want. That is interoperable data. And it's therefore reusable. So here you get the fruit salad that you wanted without the sugar. So that's just an analogy which I find is helpful for getting across both for your own learning and you might, if you want to talk to this, uh, to talk to people about uh, uh, what you did today, well, you know, we made a fruit salad. So I'm um, these are uh, some obvious points about when you might actually reuse data, so this is important. Uh, we've mentioned research, you know, uh, getting answers from lots of different people's databases and this was, the people who I think are probably not represented here are the the academics who actually want to reuse your data uh, in order to do things like your own rural settlement project and actually get new knowledge from all of this data that we gather. Uh, so that's an important use. Uh, but you might also, you might also within your own systems, be wanting to present the same data but in different forms. It's very difficult to do that if you have to recode the data. Um, similarly, if you want to combine data from more than one site, say for a, uh, a post excavation exercise, you need to draw on data from multiple sites your organisation has worked on, that's quite difficult if the data is incompatible. And as we've mentioned, moving data between systems, um, that might be to an archive, but also if you ever replace the database that you uh, use for recording your, uh, your archaeological data, it's going to be so much easier if it's standardised before you actually try to move it into a new system. So, those are some of the problems. Those are some of the potentials. Um, what I've been working on with Claire and Hugh, it's very early in days yet, is a sort of standardised way of capturing that data into one sort of well-labelled uh, system. So this is early days, but what we have here is a template for this the, based on the AGS template for recording the database. Uh, and what it is, is the different tables that you might find in your system, and then those relate to coloured tabs along the bottom. So you can record in this your site subdivisions, your context register, not all the detail of your context, just enough so that somebody can quickly get into, the, into using your, your, data, your data set, your bulk files, and your uh, samples, and special files, and so on. Um, and we can use this to define, to do that exercise that we started with uh, before. Uh, that would be sort of creating this front page of the data. But if we really want to get into the, the, the detail, we need to start thinking about what goes into each of those tabs. So, data in its rawest form. Um, this is uh, a common separated values data, as opposed to a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets and common separated values data very good, easily, you can move between them very easily, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with. But that's just an example of what you might end up with. So standardised, comma separated values data. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to a system whereby we remove the hotspots from the flow. So that, as I've said, the seed promises for the last decade or so, Everything we know, or the archive and all that we use, informs everything we do on the research side. So we have that much more smoothly. Um, and I uh, just to introduce one other term to you. I've talked about fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Frictionless is also. If you Google frictionless data, this is a, a, a happening thing, a real thing. And the analogy is with frictionless trade, which has been in the news quite a deal. Uh, there's been lots of talk about tariffs and uh, subsidies and all that sort of 
None of that's really important. There's just cost on trade. The real friction in international trade is unloading and loading ships. Uh, and this is these two photographs, a bit small for actually at the back, but these two photographs are taken 20 years apart. This is the, the sort of manual unloading and loading of sugar in London docks. And this 20 years later is Phoenix Dover. And the difference is a standardized shipping container. And once you have a standardized shipping container, your ports can be designed to accommodate those, your ships can be designed to accommodate those, and you reduce almost all the cost of moving goods from China to the UK, or indeed across. And this is for you know, most of the world population out of poverty. Now, this, this is really important stuff. So what we're, in our terms, what we're talking about is frictionless data. So we remove those costs of getting the data from one place to another. So some provocations to finish off with. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody about these, so these are just my thoughts on what should happen. Uh, FAME, uh, it's the representatives of archaeological unit managers, should be make it a requirement to share recording manuals. Uh, these are not proprietary to individual organisations, they're essential research resources. Uh, Historic England, who support fish, uh, needs to put in the work for the data standards development. Of course, you and Claire are obviously sort of both deep in that. And uh, Dan Miles, who's also at this uh, conference, uh, well versed in doing this. We have a lot of experience in developing data standards. We can do this. The Archaeology Data Service, do we have an idea? Yeah. <laughs> if you charge people to deposit archive by the number of files they deposit, is that going to be a barrier to them depositing well-structured, nicely presented data, uh, as opposed to putting it all into a PDF? Uh, and for CIFA and Algeo, do you uh, have standards and guidance and model conditions and breaches 